What is up all my fellow operatives, Taft Taylor here, and today I've got a little something special for you. I want to talk wrestling politics, and that's basically like kayfabe stuff, and that's in the professional wrestling world, the backyard wrestling world, which I'm most familiar with, and also the promo wrestling world, which is kind of a new thing that's slowly taking off, believe it or not. Some of you may not know what promo wrestling is, and that I could talk about a little bit today with you. But I wanted to try something different on this channel, is keep it strictly wrestling content, but share some of my experiences throughout my career. And this is probably going to be a little bit of a series. I'm just going to go through a little bit of a uh, this and that with you. So today I want to talk about, let's talk about the kayfabe and the social creation of good and bad. I'm going to read a little bit of an article and kind of give you a description in, in layman's terms. Uh, central to the discussion of professional wrestling and politics and the concept of, of kayfabe, the term itself is derived from a slang, pig Latin-like word for the word fake, because that is what wrestling is. It is scripted. It is a, uh, a scripted, um, uh, it's kind of like a uh, ballet. It's kind of like a play. It's, it's acting. I mean, do you ever, when you were a kid, this is how I did it, me and my friends would get together and we would play fight. Hey, yeah, let's go play fight. Let's go play fight. When you're watching your favorite action scenes in the movies, like like the Marvel movies and all that stuff, the DC movies, what do you see? Terminator. You see action heroes that are fighting. It's all scripted. It's all fake. It's all kayfabe. Well, kayfabe is a pig Latin word for the word fake. Yes, that's where a lot of people are like, you know, wrestling's fake. And that, to us, the wrestling fans, the, 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 the true diehard wrestling fans, especially somebody like me, it pisses us off when people say, man, you know wrestling's fake. Well, yeah, I know it's fake. But at the same time, these athletes, they, they're on the road 250 to 300 days a year, sometimes just never leaving. They're constantly on the road, and they're constantly performing. They never get a day off. Unlike NFL stars, NBA stars, MLB, etc., 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 but people don't understand that that are not wrestling fans. But that's all right. It's the same even in the backyard world. In the backyard world, it's the same thing. Uh, it's not that we have days off because we don't have audiences like professional wrestlers. But even with the times that we do get in that ring, or trampoline on the ground, wherever it is. We're putting our bodies on the line to entertain you, to entertain the fans. Yes, it's a yes, it's a work. It could be me and a best friend that are that are talking trash to each other, and on screen it looks like we hate each other, but really behind the scenes, we could be the best of friends. One of my greatest opponents, his name's Phoenix. He's originally from Texas. I grew up with him. He was like a brother to me. He wasn't blood brother or nothing like that, but I mean, he was one of my best friends. I knew him since he was like seven, eight years old. And when he was watching me wrestle when I was 16 and he was like 12, 13, he was like, man, I want to wrestle whenever I get of age. Okay, man. And I, you know, we were just having fun. And I was best friends with his brother, which was my same age at the time. And then as we, as he got older, he started practicing more and wanted to wrestle with me. Ended up being one of my greatest opponents ever. And you could go back and watch some of the scenes and stuff. I could probably clip some in here somehow. As you could see. And as you've seen right there, that was just a few little clips of him and me going at it. Uh, just all that was scripted. See, what we would do, we would go and wrestle. And then after that, the match is over. The show is over. We'd go clean up. And then we'd look at our tapes and we'd sit down that night while I'm spending the night with them or they're spending the night with me. And we're watching the show. We're going over the tapes. We're just checking it out. 
going over what we did, talk about what we did in the match, why we did what we did, and then see what we could do to perfect it for the next time around. And then from there, you know, we'd hang out, play video games and whatnot, eat dinner, whatever we were going to do, just, just chill. And then, uh, if anything, the next day or a couple of days later, we'd go back out and we'd practice. Thousands of hours of practice. But it's all kayfabe. And it also leads to another thing that I'd want to talk about, and that's wrestling politics. Wrestling politics backstage, it's basically when you have somebody who's, it's just like at any job. You got people who go by seniority, you know, people who have been there longer than other people. And um, say, say I've been there, I've been there for 10 years. And then this new guy comes in, he's been in there for about a year. Well, the match card puts out and then he might not like what he sees and he starts griping about it and then I see that he's griping about it so I start griping about it well the owners or whoever's running the show will probably listen more to me and the whole show could change off of one person because of politics it just depends on what it is I mean it, it could be anything and everything but um that's part of also the kayfabe world where the behind the scenes in order for that kayfabe to work the way that someone's vision is all they have to do is just go with it, you know? Um, let's try and get back on a topic real fast. So, Cafe was developed to boost the entertainment value of the spectacle. Uh, the switch to a pure kayfabe show did not occur until the early 20th century, actually, believe it or not. Before that time, wrestling was able to straddle both the entertainment realms and that of the organized martial sports, uh, such as boxing, judo, and gymnastics. Uh, wrestlers are and have been highly skilled athletes, many with a background in the amateur wrestling or field sports. And that, to an extent, can be true as well. See, I actually, one of my backgrounds was in high school. I actually did a lot of amateur wrestling, uh, kind of like that Olympic-style wrestling where you're on the on the mat, and you wrestle the guy to the ground, you get the head cuffs and all that stuff. Um, I was actually in football, uh, junior varsity football, and I was a running back. And on days that it was raining and thunderstorming outside, our coach actually would make us go in and do a little bit of wrestling in the, you know, on the mat inside the gym. And that was where I actually got my first real taste of wrestling um, before the backyard stuff. <clears throat> and again, this is in junior high, um, not high school. So I would actually be really good at it because I've always watched wrestling. I've always been a big fan of wrestling ever since I was three years old. And um, I, I've, a, I've been a fan of wrestling since, since WrestleMania 3. And that's exactly how old I am. I'm as old as WrestleMania. You look at the WrestleMania number and that's basically how old Taft Taylor is. <laughs> a little fun fact for you. Um, but yeah, the, I, all it is, it's entertainment. These guys, they get in the ring. And whether it's in the backyard world, the professional world, or even in the promo world, we're, we're putting on a show for the fans to see, man, these guys hate each other. I want to see them go neck and neck. I want to see them hit each other. I want to see them hurt each other because that's what we live for. We live for that action. We live for that dance. We live for that, that shoot sometimes, as you want to put it. You know what I mean? And that goes back to basically like something like this. Regardless of venue, of the professional wrestlers or backyard wrestlers, the act was a job. Um, as Carrick from 1980 points out, wrestlers and promoters consider professional wrestling or backyard wrestling to be first and foremost a business. Before the purely kayfabe era, it was not uncommon to have shoots or legitimate wrestling bouts for either a championship title or as means to create crowd support for a wrestler who may be in line for a shot at a title. So what that basically means is the show's going to revolve usually around one or two people because of everybody's competing to be the best. And the best is usually the champion, the world champion. And when you have a world champion, everybody is competing to fight to be with that world champion so they can contend against each other. All the other ones are considered workers. They're, they're putting the, the work in even more, and they're showing why they deserve to be on top. And that can go a lot into promos, especially whenever I do promos. But we can set that for another video later on if y'all enjoy this series. Um, 
In a shoot, the outcome was never determined beforehand and would often lead to a draw or some under us, un, uninteresting anticlimactic contest. In these events, bookers or promoters, which I've been both, who came from the entertainment background, found that they had to answer to angry spectators who felt they had paid for a spectacle which never materialized. An uninteresting or in, 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 in <laughs> Let me redo that. An uninteresting match could, after all, prompt calls for a refund from the spectators. And these demands were often backed up with the threat of a very real violence. That right there, I know it's kind of getting off topic, but in a way still. What, I, what that is, what I'm reading there, it sounds like before what sports entertainment is now, what kayfabe wrestling is now, back in the day you'd see two guys fighting and nothing really happened. It's just they, they were wrestling in the ring until one guy was down. And then it's like there's, there's nothing to it. And it upset a lot of fans. Because they're paying money to come see these guys wrestle and knock their heads off. And they're not, seeing, they're not coming there to see them just do something real, you know, silly. And pit each other. And then both men are up and then shake hands and walk off. So that's where the kayfabe world is. That's where the acting comes in. That's what you call. And I'll get into the to the thing selling that's where selling comes in a real wrestler who can sell is a guy who makes the other opponent look like a million bucks makes him look like he's really doing the work make him you you want to make the believability come out when you're selling and that could go in the backyard world the professional world hell even the kayfabe world if you really work at it but mostly we're here to talk about pro wrestling and backyard wrestling one thing that I learned from probably one of the greatest of all time is Ric Flair. Ric Flair was what they called the 60-minute man. The 60-minute man, Ric Flair, the nature boy Ric Flair, would sell his ass off to the fans. He, he would go into a promotion, into a territory where there was a guy who was their champion who didn't have a whole lot of uh, fire behind him, make him look like he was the be-all, end-all. And have Ric Flair bounce all over that ring and just like tear him up. Of course, Rick would get the ring, get the win, but um, nonetheless, he would leave making that guy in that territory look like he was the next big thing. And that's what you call working, and that's what you call selling, and that's what you call making your opponents look like they are the be all end all. Selling is one of the greatest things of all time, and you know, when it comes to the professional world. Here's something that's a little interesting. To prevent these boring non-spectacles, promoters began to push for matches that were works. Productions that were not factually true per se, but rather went where true within the reality of kayfabe. So that's where the believability comes in. That's where you're putting on a shoot. You're making the audience believe that everything you're saying and doing in that ring is 110% real. When actuality, it isn't. And that's that's what makes that really, really fun. And they started doing that to sell on the crowds, to get the crowds involved, to get the crowds to believe, like, wow, these guys hate each other. These guys are going to destroy each other. This is gold. This is entertainment. And it, it's like that everywhere. Um, these matches were complete with angles or scripted feuds. Uh, designed to build programs. The earliest programs dating from the mid to late 19th century developed from the more organic aspects of competition found in boxing, itself a scandal-prone sport. A program often consisted of several scheduled bouts between various wrestlers and wrestling cliques. So that's just basically talking about, you know, putting on scripts. It's just like acting. It's a whole, it's like a wrestling script in a sort of way. You can go out there in the backyard world. You don't really have to have a script. It just depends on the two guys that go out there. And that's where you can tell who the rookies are and who the true pros are. Nothing wrong with rookies. Nothing wrong with guys who are green. Green is a layman's term for saying that they're new and they're still learning. Uh, beginner mode, basically. But all it is, is you got to learn your aspect. You got to learn your craft. You got to learn the dance. When you learn all that, that's where the scripting comes in. I went to TBW, Tennessee Backyard Wrestling, and there was a match I had with a guy. Um, and right when I got there, 
one thing I wanted to do because of my experience. I wanted to talk about the match. I wanted to talk about three things. I wanted to talk about the opening of the match, how the match is going to start. I wanted to talk about um, what we're going to do somewhere in the middle. And then like a spot, which is basically an opening spot, a middle spot, and an ending spot. The ending to the match. I like to do that. Every wrestler is a little bit different, but that's how I put my matches together. I talk about those three things with every single opponent that I ever get in the ring with, mostly. It just depends on how the the situation is. It depends on who I'm working with. It depends on who anybody's working with. Every wrestler, again, like I said, is different. But what I would do is I'd talk about my opening spot, what I wanted to do when the match started. I wanted to talk about the middle spot, what was going to happen somewhere, a little middle thing that's going to happen in the middle f for us to happen. And then uh, the ending spot, of course, how the match is going to end, who's going to do what and why. And, of course, we do all the communication with the referee so they know. Referee, in a sort of way, has a big job. He's not only just there to count one, two, three, or make sure that somebody's tapping out and, and make sure the wrestlers are following the rules. He's actually there for guidance. He's there to tell you about the time, you know, if there's a time limit to the match. He's also there to tell you um, basically your spots in case you forget. You could be sidetracked because you're sitting there entertaining and stuff, and he might have to remind you, hey, James, uh, remember you're going to do that one spot. You haven't done it yet. Oh, yeah, gotcha. And then you do it. You know what I mean? So it, there's, there's a lot that goes on into it. And even in the backyard world, it can be like that. It just depends on the promotion, the company, the match, all that stuff. Um, you like kayfabe. Also establish a system of good guys and bad guys. Uh, basically known as faces and heels, respectively. These roles were completely angle-based and could change several times over the course of a single wrestler's career. And I've been that. Uh, these faces were usually the crowd favorites. Uh, the faces were usually the crowd favorites. But heel wrestlers were also quite popular. These were characters that most fans loved to hate, but that many fans also idolized because they re represented the breaking of norms with impunity. As wrestling became uh, more of a dramatic spectacle and less of a pure sporting competition, these roles, as well as the role of tweener or someone who would at any moment f act as a face or a heel, which I was kind of an in-betweener, uh, became increasingly important to the maintenance of kayfabe. So let's go ahead. We're going to talk about this, and then this will be the end of the video. You have faces, which are basically the good guys, the guys like what Hulk Hogan was. Hulk Hogan was the guy who, he was the poser, he was the hero, he was the man that came out there and kicked ass, did what he had to do to get the job done. Not what he had to do, but followed all the rules, said his prayers, took his vitamins, all that good stuff. You've all heard it who are big wrestling fans. You know, guys like that are the, your faces. And they were the old school faces, the baby faces. But then you got the guys who were the heels, like Ric Flair. You had guys like Ric Flair, Chris Jericho, you know, the Randy Orton, Triple H, some of the guys that were the best at being heels. I'm going with like the top tiers for right now. Hulk Hogan is being one of the ultimate baby faces. Ric Flair is being one of the ultimate heels. See, Ric Flair was that guy that a lot of men idolized because he went out there, he talked the talk, and he walked the walk. He went out there, he was the best at the time in promo. He would do the most amazing promos and then go out there, sell his ass off, and make that hero like Hulk Hogan or Sting or whoever he was in the ring with, Ricky Steamboat, make them look like they were the be-all, end-all. Like, oh my God. His job as a heel, which any heel's job is, is to make that face look like they are everything that they say they are because they're the hero, right? Ric Flair was the, was like the everything at that. <sighs> then you got the tweeners, the guys that are in between, the guys who actually wanted to be more heel who would break the rules and then actually just ended up being one of the ultimate faces of all time. It's guys like Stone Cold Steve Austin. In the backyard world, it'd be a guy like me, the nemesis James Taylor. We didn't care about the rules, 
but we got over with the fans. We got over with the fans because of the intensity. Stone Cold was one of those guys who would just get over with that intensity. That glass would break. I mean, he went out there, and there would be times in the early times when they were starting to cheer for him. He'd be like, like, I need anybody's opinion. None of you did anything for me. But it, as much as he would trash them, they loved it, and they kept going. And that's what made him become a phenomenon in his own time. And I, some, some, a lot of fans, a lot of backyard fans too, guys like me, idolized something like that. That, in my, my eyes, kind of became the norm because it's not hard to be a heel or a face in that role because you could fit anywhere in between because no matter what, you get over. In the promo world, I'm kind of that character, not to, you know, feed my own ego, but in a way, I, I feel like I'm that type of character. In the backyard world, that's how I present myself. That's how a lot of guys are. There's so many different aspects to wrestling and with the with the heels and the faces and the in-betweeners. But nonetheless, it's all in fun and it's all an act. So uh, this is going to be part one of this series, just wrestling topics. Please, in the comment section below, if there, you have some questions, is there anything that you're interested in knowing, um, please put some topics down in the comment section below and I will definitely talk about them if you all enjoy this series. Where This is basically going to be the Wrestling Kayfabe series. Backyard wrestling, pro wrestling, promo wrestling, whatever it is you want to talk about. And we got stories to come. And we also got episodes of the Nemesis Sessions coming up. And I got some guests lined up for that. So please stay tuned. Until next time, I will catch all your asses down the road. And that's because it can't be no other way.